Good. Nice. I guess we're ready to start. Too fast. Nice. Thank you so very much for being here. Um, so this is tutorials about previously preserving machine learning. And um, you can find a deck, the, the deck of these lights at la that link. And it's a slightly um, different version I'm talking about. Uh, in, in during the talk, but the original one is there it's on speaker deck, and the materials is on GitHub. If you want to follow along, uh, github.com slash Majo, which is my username, and ppml tutorial slash 3 slash eurosci 23 is the branch we're going to use. Uh, I'm going to explain why we're using that branch in a few seconds. I just want to introduce myself very quickly for those of you not knowing me. I am Valerio. I'm very nice meeting all of you here, and thank you very much for coming. Um, I am a researcher and a data scientist. I've been working in universities for many years. I'm now working in Anaconda as a developer, data scientist advocate, and also I'm a, a fellow of the Software Sustainability Institute, SSI. And uh, today I'm actually having both hats, mostly SSI hat, uh, talking about uh, previously preserving machine learning is part of my uh, fellowship with the SSI. So, and that's my, my t-shirt today uh, about the, the institute. So I would be more than happy to talk about uh, SSI Institute, the, what they do, uh, what they support. It's a fantastic community. I'm really, really happy to be uh, SSI fellow. And so this is like uh, a short summary of myself in logos. Uh, this is like the serious part of myself, the, the less serious part of myself. I am actually quite Python uh, addicted and, and geek. So exactly last year, I said I'm a Magic the Gathering player, and I found a Magic the Gathering player in the audience. So since then, I'm going to repeat this in all my talks. So it's more or less an, an, a year I'm talking about this thing. Uh, so if you happen to, to play Magic the Gatherings or Dungeons and Dragons, if you want, let's talk to me. Um, I'm also uh, involved in the organization of many conferences. Python Italia is one of the main ones, uh, PyData events. All along. I'm actually living in Bristol in the UK, so I'm also supporting the PyData meetup there, uh, which is particularly nice because we, uh, we have a very vibrant community of Pythonists over there. Cool. That's enough about myself. And so I just want to say very quick things uh, about the material. Um, I'm going to, so the plan is I'm going to talk through you these slides in, um, in more or less. Uh, 10 minutes to 15 minutes just to introduce the, the topic. And then we're going to switch to the, um, uh, the repository and we go back and forth. Uh, the tutorial is organized in two um, parts mainly. And uh, this is essentially a shorter version of a longer tutorial I gave at SciPy conference late, uh, earlier this year. So that's why we're using this branch. So EuroSciPy 23 is the branch with reduced, specifically summarized version. If you're interested in the extended version, you just go to the main branch and you have everything, essentially. It's a five hours tutorial, so it's gonna, the material is gonna be more details. And I try to, try to explain what are the missing pieces in today's tutorials, so you can find in the main tutorial as well. Um, I, I believe Constantine has kindly shared the link of the, of the materials on Telegram for quickly access, but just be, just be sure you're um, cloning the USI Pi 23 uh, branch. And in the meantime, if you want to follow along, uh, since we're going to need um, a few specific packages, uh, most of our code is going to run on scikit-learn, PyTorch, uh, so it's, it's going to be uh, basic packages you find in the standard uh, Anaconda distribution, if you're using Anaconda Python distribution. And the setup.md has detailed instructions. If you don't want to run everything, you find all the instructions on the repository as well. I recommend using uh, Anaconda notebooks if you want to. Uh, it's like um, you don't need to install anything. There's a, there's, there's a SciPy tutorial environment specifically done with everything there. so you. you you don't need to install anything on your computer if you want to. Nice. Uh, I'm going to go back and forth about these things uh, uh, through, but I wanted to be I wanted to be sure that you get the materials in the beginning. And and if you want to, if you have questions, if you want to interrupt any time, please feel free to do it. Nice. 
So what's the aim of this tutorial is provide another view of the emerging tools in the Python ecosystem and specifically for privacy and unsig technologies, uh, or also known as uh, PTs, uh, with a focus on machine learning. So just to be clear, Previously in Unseek Technologies is not all about machine learning. We're just going to focus specifically on how these, uh, these, these technologies apply to the machine learning domain. So leading to what is generally called privacy observing uh, machine learning or PPML. Uh, why I'm doing this, I told you already, it's part of my fellowship plan of the SSI. And the reason why I wanted to talk about these things is, is because um, I get involved into this specific topic uh, more or less three years ago. Uh, I found it particularly interesting uh, for many reasons. And on top of everything, uh, it's a very interesting topic in which you essentially combine lots of, lots of uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, topics. You have maths, or you have algorithms, you have computer science, you have machine learning. So for me, it was like very, very interesting. And there's also lots of effort in the open source community as well. So it's, it's a combination of many, many things I like. And so that's why I'm here talking about it. And I believe it's a very interesting uh, topic per se, because it, it talks about privacy. It talks about what machine learning can do and what machine learning could potentially do better without doing any harm to the privacy of sensitive data. And I've also been working a lot with medical data in my career, so sensitivity uh, to, uh, of, of the data was always around the corner and was always the case of working on medical, on medical data in general. And just to be clear, uh, every, all, all, the, all my materials is on GitHub, but if you have suggestions, so you want to contribute it, you want to integrate bits, I'm more than happy uh, to review everything. Nice. Let's introduce privacy in the beginning. And I, I want to introduce this by guiding you through something that you probably already know uh, or you remember. Um, the, the case of fa uh, Facebook Cambridge Analytical, Analytica, sorry, there's a typo there, scandal. So we're talking 2014, 2018. 2014, Facebook quiz, uh, there was a Facebook quiz called This Is Your Digital Life. And they invited people, users, to find out their personality type. This is what they did. In particular, what they did during this, they developed an app collecting uh, data and, uh, from participants. And the interesting thing was that this app was also recording information about the public profile of these participants, uh, and so their friends list, without any specific consent. In 2015, the Guardian reported that Cambridge Analytica had data from this app and used it to psychologically profile voters in the US. In particular, they had collected 305,000 people installed the app, and so 87 million of data was gathered without any specific consent. So in the 2018, the US and the British lawmakers demanded that Facebook explain how the firm was able to harvest this personal information without any consent. And that was actually the beginning of the, the, the scandal. Uh, so the result was Facebook apologized for the data scandal and announced changes to the privacy setting. That was probably the beginning of awareness in the community that whenever we interact with systems, there's also sensitivity involved. And lots of things have been done um, since then uh, at different levels. Uh, regulatory uh, things, so you, I'm pretty sure you all know GDPR, which is the uh, legal thing about uh, data protection in the EU, and other countries have similar schemes. Um, what we're going to talk about today is none, not even close to any of that. We just try to talk about what ca can technology uh, can do, and how do we handle uh, sensitivity when we do data science, in particular machine learning. So what about machine learning? We know that human learning is different from machine learning. And if we don't know, I'm going to explain it with a very simple example. So as you can see here, you have a picture of a puppy. Very cute, fantastic. But what the, and, and what the actual algorithm is going to read from this picture is more or less like you know three matrices in different channels. And in the end, it's going to be a bunch of numbers. So what we say is a puppy in, in the picture. It's going to be 
different from what the machine, or the algorithm if you want, is going to say that's a puppy in the, in the, in the picture. And um, so it's clear that human learning and machine learning have two different challenges, and they also work differently, uh, specifically the kind of machine learning we're talking today. And so machine learning normally requires millions of samples, uh, even for very simple tasks like this is an apple or this is not an apple. In fact, we say machine learning models are data hungry. But what, what if we propose these pictures to humans? Do you think these are apples? I wasn't really sure when I saw them the first time. You're probably familiar with those, but I wasn't. So I wasn't really sure whether those were apples or not. So we're talking two different problems. And according to Google, those are apples. So just, just saying, I have no idea. And uh, there's this very interesting papers uh, from 2009, indeed, uh, call it uh, titled The Unreasonable Effectiveness of Data, essentially telling that in the end, it, data is always better than model. Uh, over, there, there was a um, uh, machine translation, I believe. Task, a machine does ambiguation, I don't remember exactly, but anyway, the point is, in the long, uh, in the longer extend, even when you have lots of data, even simple model can resolve, uh, have the same performance of, of more complicated models if you have the right data. So we all know that data is always the case uh, with machine learning. And so why I'm saying all of this? Because I'm trying to put the focus on data and why data is important. So how, how about the privacy of data? Well, normally when you have data hungry models, you, you would assume the more data you have, the better the, better the model is. And so to, to attain that goal, essentially you push for high quality curated open data set. And this is the case, especially in machine learning for medical domain, when you have this data set which has been publicly shared with highly curated selection of the data. And, um, and th this is actually the goal. But when you have sensitive data, well, you need to keep data safe. And the, 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 the safety of the data can be actually uh, preserved from either intentional or unintentional leakage. And, and so the result of all this, the result of these approach, is like you have data and models kept in silos. I'm going to talk about why also models are being kept in silos in a while. But in general, the approach is I have this very s fantastic data, but they are indeed private. And so they need to stay private because they contain sensitive information. So I'm going to be the owner of the data. And if you want to work with my data, I'm going to be you know, the bottleneck. And in particular, I'm going to give you a sort of surrogated version of my data in order for you to work on them. And in essence, the whole thing is, this idea of privacy protection is all about data protection. Okay? So it's data accounting for privacy, also known as privacy preserving data. And I, I don't know how many of you here is familiar with k-anonymity as approach. Any of you know this algorithm already? Okay. So thank you. Uh, so k-anonymity is a very popular algorithm, and it works based on the concept that privacy is a property of data. And in particular, it works in this way. You, you have a data set, normally a table. That's the, the simplest way to imagine it. So what you're trying to do is making sure that people, uh, single records are not uh, easily recognizable in the data set. So you essentially modify the data from the original one. So you change the values in this table so that you have at least k samples in the data set that have the same values. So um, this is one of the parts we're not going to see in the details in this tutorial, but you're more than welcome to see that in the extended version. Uh, but essentially what you're going to do is, for example, if you're working on, I don't know, uh, salary information uh, or age of the participants in the data set, you're not going to, you're go not going to uh, look at the actual exact age. You're going to modify like average or taking, I don't know, the least decimal, or the upper decimal, whatever you want to. Uh, and so you slightly change the original data, which is the K anonymized data set in the picture, so that you come up with a, with a data set which guarantees that up to the K number, K is a parameter, uh, K entries in this data set are, are like, have, have the same values 
And so uh, you, you will, not a, uh, will not ever to tell that whether you're talking about sample A or sample B, because they have the same, the same values. And this is what, how privacy um, uh, protection was working uh, a few years ago, when you had um, medical data, for example. You had clinical information. You anonymize it with k-anonymity, so you like obfuscate a few details, and you share the data. So far, so good. And the problem comes when you have uh, additional data. So let me give you an example. Imagine you have this patient's medical records, and I'm trying to capture the idea that you have multiple information there by different colors. So you have a sanitized history of medical prescription, and the sanitization essentially complain, uh, can, uh, concerns the fact that you essentially are hiding the information of the single uh, patients. And if you're using this history of medical patients, uh, by themselves, it's very fine, so no harm done. But what if you also have a data set of pharmacy visited? And if you combine the two, you essentially come up with a data set, and you can correlate medications and disease, and that's exactly probably what you wanted to do, and so far, so far, no problem. But you can also correlate information like patients bought meds from which pharmacy? And you can roughly infer the zip codes from residency, even without address, the address info specific. So, for example, you can do something like the most visited pharmacy. And so you can correlate external information by adding an external data set, um, essentially uh, breaking this, this idea of k anonymity in the data set, because you have an external data set. This particular kind of attack uh, this is like the, the, the terminology used in this particular case. It's called linkage attack, or oh, linking attack. Uh, there, may, there, there are many cases. Uh, probably one of the most popular one is the 2020 census data. So using a linking attack to the census data, to the US census data, if I'm not mistaken, they were able to, to reconstruct up to 70% of the records because of publicly available data correlating to the anonymized data in the US census. So the, the thing is, um, thinking of a privacy as a data property is probably not the right way. That, that's the takeaway message from this, from this block. Um, what about machine learning? So machine learning have been subject to threats and attacks since 2008, probably, in, at least in these this timelines. So you can actually attack machine learning models in order to reconstruct sensitive information in the machine learning. So you have a different series of attacks, or the anonymization, reconstruction attack, parameter inference attack, and uh, membership inference attack. We're going to see a couple of them, actually. And in general, machine learning threats uh, are essentially categorized as in software testing. So you have black box attacks, white box attacks, depending on whether you have information about how the model is done or the internals, the internals of the model. So you can issue an attack to machine learning um, either knowing how the machine learning works, so what the model is, how, if, if it's a deep network, you, exactly having the information about how the, the, the architecture is done, or you can actually attack the model as a black box. You have different kind of attacks, and the, why you want to do it? Because essentially, especially deep networks, the way they do work, they suffer from a problem called memoization. So they do. Uh, um, so if you, if you use this information carefully, you can actually extract from the gradients, um, you can reconstruct since the data the model has been trained on. And so we'll be, we'll be seeing an example of these and, and possible um, solution. So um, just to say that talking about privacy is always a matter of dilemma, and this is always the case whether you're talk we're talking about k-anonymity or not. 
uh, it's always a matter of balancing between utility and privacy, as in the more you keep data private, the less informative the data become. And so you can have the most secure, the most private data you wanted, but in the end, this data is going to be uh, rubbish for the machine learning, so you're not going to use them really because they're not going to be useful at all for the learning bit. And so it's always a matter of balancing between keeping the data private and uh, uh, keeping the data still useful for, for learning something. Good. Let's talk about now model threats. Uh, we're going to see two examples, and th this is the, the moment in which we switch to the, uh, the repository in a second. Uh, we're going to talk about two two uh, vulnerabilities. The first one is probably one of the most uh, popular one. Uh, it's called uh, adversarial examples. Is any of you here familiar with this already? Fabulous, exactly what I was expecting. Essentially, it's a very, very popular case of model vulnerabilities. And the focus here is understanding how you can threat a machine learning model. Uh, so for those of you not familiar with it, essentially what's happening here is I have a picture of a panda and the model can say that this is a panda uh, with 75.7% of confidence. If we carefully change this image by adding some very surgically selected noise to this image, uh, so you have a 0 point, a 0 0.07 as a parameter, and this is going to be essentially the tuning we're going to do. So that 0 0.07 is a parameter, and then you have a noise um, which is essentially chosen according to the sign of the gradient. So if you're thinking how deep the network works, essentially this noise goes in the opposite direction how the, mo the model is learning, because it's, going, it's following the sign of the gradient, not the opposite sign. Um, you, you come up with that picture, so if you look at that, that image, you would never say this data has been tampered. Well, the model says that, and the model says that's exactly a gibbon with the 99.3% of confidence. So this is to say two things. Again, machine learning and human learning works differently, and so they do see things in data that, we, that human don't, and so that's the first takeaway. The second takeaway is the kind of threats we're posing to the model here is on the data. So we're, we're tampering the data up to a point that it becomes uh, clear that the model is actually going into um, um, producing the, the wrong prediction. And we can probably now switch to the code. And in particular, this goes here. So again, this is the material here on the Reuse SciPy 23 uh, branch. Um, Right, and if you want to follow along, I'm going to zoom in a little bit. If you want to follow along, just feel free. Um, essentially, I've had most of it, if in the interest of time, most of it uh, executed already, and, but any, everything should be working fine on your laptops anyway. So it's not that um, computational heavy. Uh, just the, some of the interesting bits I haven't, so we'll do this live together. Okay, so the fast gradient sign attack, FGSA kind of attack, um, works exactly this way. What we do here, uh, just to be clear, is a white box approach, so we know how the model works, and we also have access to the predictions of the model. So in this example, what we're going to do, so this is the example I already told you, uh, let me see if I can open a notebook here. So probably I, right. So I can probably get rid of uh, all the Jupyter Lab thing. Nice. So what we're going to do is, first off, we're using Linet model, pre-trained, and we're going to use MNIST data set. Very simple, uh, very popular, and, and easy to understand. So the, this Linet model is pre-trained, and we have uh, weights that can be get directly from the repository, so you don't have to do anything. And um, downloading the data, is this big enough? Can you see in the back? Brilliant. So we download the Amnesty dataset, nothing fancy here. 
And we, before the attack, let's have a look how the model performs on this data. So the model has a 98% of accuracy on the MNIST. So this is pre-trained, we're not running any training, and that's it. So this is what we have. So we start with a 0.98 accuracy. Good. So let's talk about the FGSM attack. So the FGSM attack, what does is it first off gets the, so this, this function is getting the image, which is a tensor, or the epsilon parameter, which is, if you remember the picture, that point, uh, that point 007, that was the epsilon parameter. And we're going to play with this parameter a little bit. So we see what's the effect of that parameter. And then we have the data gradient. So the data gradient is another tensor, and essentially is the gradient uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the layers of the model uh, we have. So first thing, we take the sign of the gradient. It's very few lines of PyTorch, by the way. Uh, we, take the, we take the sign of the gradient. We change the original image by adding epsilon times the sign of the gradient. And then we clamp the value between 0 and 1 because we, have, we want to make it an actual image. So it's a tensor of an image. So we normalize it in 0, 1 uh, to make an actual image, and we return the image. So in three lines of code here, we just implemented this picture. Image plus epsilon times the sign of the gradient. This is what we're doing. So, and then we test the model. So in this function, it's... It, it's very verbose, and actually, uh, it's also uh, lots of comments. But what it does there is all the, pic all the, all the images that the model is going to predict wrong already, we're not interested. The model is wrong already on that samples, so we're not going to tamper them. For those the model is producing, it is predicting correctly, we're going to apply the attack. So we tamper the original images. This is what this function is doing. And in fact, if um, um, blah, blah, blah. And what we do in, in, instead uh, is we calculate how many, uh, what's the accuracy of the predictions in the end. So we first, we run the attack with an epsilon value of 0.05. That's the first value we get. And if we test with that value, we already have a accuracy of 0.94. So we have a drop in the accuracy already. We started from 98%. We already dropped to 94%. And the effect of some of the samples that have been mistakenly uh, predicted are these ones. So you can see this was a 5, has been predicted as a 6, 3 has been predicted as a 2, 9 has been predicted as an 8, and so on and so forth. Uh, but if you look at the images, they don't look like, they look genuine images, right? They don't look like you've been mod modifying the images, okay? Now, the exercise, which I'm not going to do in the interest of time, but uh, just to see what's the effect of, thank you, uh, what, what, to see the, the <laughs> yes, um, uh, the, the effect of epsilon on, onto this one is trying different values of epsilon and see what, what's going on here. So trying the multiple values here, so from 0.95 up to 0.3, essentially, so using these values, we have a drop in accuracy. So we had 94%, 92%, 85%, 68%, 43%, 20%, 0.08%. .08%, .08%. So when we have a value of epsilon big like this, so 0 0.3, we have accuracy which essentially drops entirely. But what's the effect of it? Well, this is the drop of the accuracy from the, the, the first one up to the last one. But this is the degradation of the images you get. So with 0.06, we have these images. But if you keep going, Essentially, you, the, more you, the more you add noise, the more you, you can tell these images have not been, uh, have been tampered. Uh, and if you look at your laptop, probably you can appreciate even better. So these two look similar on the projector, but I promise you they are not that similar, at least on my laptop. So, um, 
this is essentially the effect. So you, the more you add noise, the more you can tell the data is not the original one. And so you essentially find out that the model has been tampered. Um, and that's, that's the effect of adversarial attacks. But the, the, the very idea of adversarial attacks, and that's why they're called this way, is that you want to generate examples which are intentionally made to fool the model in a way that you can't, you human, you cannot tell. This is the, the whole idea of adversarial attacks. So this is just for, as an exercise to understand what's going on here. So fast good? Good. So this is, this is the first and probably the most popular thing you, you can say about model threats. So we know, we probably now can appreciate the fact that machine learning models are not safe as they are. Uh, as, as, um, as models, just because they're machine learning and models and they, like, they have nothing to do with the data. They have more to do with the data than you think. And that's the, 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 the first takeaway message. Now we actually switch on a kind of a different kind of attack. So this was an adversarial example and that was a, an issue on the data. Let's talk about now on another kind of a model uh, stealing uh, attack called model inversion attacks. So this is taken from a paper, uh, uh, and what you can see here is on the left-hand side, uh, sorry, on the right-hand side, you see the original image. On the left-hand side, you see the image reconstructed from a trained model. So what we're talking here is you have a, uh, you have a trained model, and you use this model as an API, so it's a black box. Okay, so you have no idea how the model works. You only have access to predictions. So you have, again, imagine it as an API. So essentially you ask the model, what is the, uh, you know, what's the, the prediction generated for a single sample? The model responds, and that's it. And based on this information, you're essentially trying to reconstruct uh, the predictions. And ultimately, you can reconstruct the data the model has been trained on. And that's the idea of model inversion attacks. So yeah, this is a collection of three different papers cited here. And what we're going to do now is essentially try to uh, replicate the experiment they run there in a simplified way, because they had a few bits and bobs to make it even more, you know, more evident uh, what you're doing. But it still proves the point. So, uh, do do do. Yes. Let's now switch to notebooks again, and we're going to see now model inversion attack training. Okay. So, this example is a replication of what you can find in that paper from 2015, model inversion attacks, and that was the first paper talking about this kind of things. We, uh, just to be clear, there's a bit of misunderstanding with terminology. Uh, it's a 2015 paper, so terminology is a bit confusing. Uh, they do introduce two models, the soft, what they call soft max regression problem, uh, model and multilayer perceptron. Uh, the soft max regression problem uh, model, apologies, is no more than a single layer network with a soft max. That's it. So they call it softmax regression, as in logistic regression with softmax with single layer. Anyway, but that was the, the terms they use. So I, I, I'm using the same names, um, but uh, this is what it is. And I'll show you the implementation in PyTorch in a second. And we're going to use that data set. It's called All Faces um, or AT&T Face Database. Um, I have to be, um, I have to admit that this database wasn't really available. I had to go on web archive to find it, and I sort of wrapped up into an all faces uh, PyTorch dataset class. So, uh, similarly to MNIST uh, dataset, so it's a vision dataset you can actually use if you want. It's included in the dataset. Uh, in the repository, I mean. Um, so, here is the samples taken from these. Oh, let me have a look at the notebooks. So here are the samples included in the uh, database. I can even do this. Right. So um, what we're talking about is a database of different faces. Every single uh, class, and it's a classification data set, uh, every single, single class corresponds to a 
person, to a human being, and the multiple pictures of a single class are the same person taken from different perspectives. And the, 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 task, the learning task is to recognize who's who in the pictures kind of thing, right? So these are the kind of images we have in the data set. And um, uh, yeah, that's it. Nothing else to say about it. So we have the first model is a soft max regression. Um, again, this soft max regression model, uh, we can actually have a look at the implementation here, just to be super clear what we're talking about. We have two models. The soft max regression is no more than a linear layer with a soft max in the end. And a multi-layer perceptron is an actual multi-layer perceptron. So it's a linear, is a, is a um, multi-networks multi with the one hidden layer. Um, so you have the linear and the two linear and then the soft max again. So essentially we have two different models. MLP is slightly more complicated than a soft max regression, but um, they're the very two simple networks anyway. And, it, and again, it's, it's all about proving a point here, so it's not really important. So we have this function, training function. We train it, and uh, we have the train loader, the test loader, nothing interesting. We, we pass on the optimizer. I just want to put the focus on this train function here, because this is going to be relevant in the second block after this. Just keep this in mind. So we have this train function, uh, which I implemented. Oh, no. What did I do? Fine. I don't trust. This. Oh, yeah, that's because it's probably written multiple times. Sorry. Um, so what, what, what this, this string function is something I developed. So it's my code, nothing fancy here. But it's just a simple function that takes a model and optimizer, loaders, epochs, model name to save the, to save the, uh, the train model, and verbosity if you want to have it like during the training. Nothing like boilerplate, use standard boilerplate. Uh, um, uh, PyTorch training. Um, so we train the softmax regression model. In the end, we come up with a 95% 95.8% uh, 95 of accuracy on this data set. So it works on, on, on this data set. If we train MLP, it takes slightly longer because it's slightly more complicated. But in the end, it's 93% uh, accuracy anyway. So you don't have to train it on your own. You also have checkpoints on, uh, on the repositories, so you can restart the model from, from the train model and be ready to run the attack, which is actually what we're going to do now. So now that we have the train model, let me open the notebook here. So what we're doing here, we have, we have been gathering the data, we have defined the models, we have trained the models, so we have the, model, the, the train models, and this is just in preparation of what we're going to see now. Uh, so imagine that you have these models already, and they do stand behind an API. So now you have the train model, and your models are serving someone asking for predictions. So they're actually working, telling you, uh, this is an image, or yeah, this is an image, this is the class, this is the image, this is the class, this is what we're going to do. The model inversion attacks, um, so same thing. Uh, this is one of the notebooks I want to run. So, so it's probably more effective. And I am probably using the wrong kernel, am I? I just realized that. No, I'm not. Sorry. Yes. Okay. Let me open it again. Sorry about that. That's it. Good. Let's see if we're lucky this time. Feels like it. It's an old laptop, sorry about that. It's taking a bit longer to initialize it. OK, so we have the data set downloaded already, so I'm not going to download it. But if you haven't, you're going to download the data automatically. And is it big enough, this one? Right. So the reconstruction attack is 
again having some parameters. It's explained in the paper actually. So I, what my intention was like really trying to replicate what they did uh, in a simpler way because they they also had some extra operations to to even uh, gather more information uh, out of the uh, of the of the models. Um, but so we have a few number of parameters. We have alpha, which is the total number of iterations. We're going to try to repeat the attack. Uh, beta is the maximum number of iterations without improvements. Uh, gamma is a threshold of the cost. I'm going to explain in a second. And lambda is essentially the learning rate we use in the uh, reconstruction attack. So the whole idea of the reconstruction attack is explained in this um, um, uh, snapshot from the paper. The model inversion phase is taking these parameters, is taking a label, alpha, beta, gamma, and lambda. And what we're trying to do is essentially having a cost function defined as 1 minus f uh, label, which is the predicted label from the model, plus some auxiliary term. Uh, we're not going to use it. And for a certain number of times, up to alpha times, we do call, uh, so we have x0, which is a tensor of zeros. So we start with a blank. We have no idea what the model is producing. And remember, the model is indeed, uh, sorry, I'm lost. Oh, let me, let me just close this one. Yes. I switch. Switch laptop. Sorry, not this one. This other one. Good. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Did I close the right one? Cancel. Sorry. There you go. So I can close this one. Good. Nice. Sorry. Um, so we do uh, start with a tensor of, uh, with an empty tensor because we have no idea where we're going. So it's like a tensor of zeros, and then we keep on changing this tensor by calling a process function, which is the actual attack. And if um, if uh, the um, um, if the cost function on this tensor is above some the maximum of all the possible cost function we've uh, considered so far, then essentially we, uh, we break. So we have a better number of times we try to improve it. If we don't, we stop it. Um, and if we have already um, uh, exceeded uh, the, the cost, we still, we still break it. And essentially, we return what the model is thinking um, uh, of, um, of, of the original um, uh, image. Essentially, so let me go back to the code so it, we we simplify it. It's indeed very simple. So um, we specify a criterion. So we, the only thing we know is that how the model works, and the the it's still a black box attack because we don't know anything about the architecture. Um, this is really bothering me. Yeah, I know. Um, uh, <laughs> And um, good. So um, the the only thing we know about it is that the model works using stochastic gradient descent approach. So we know that the model is optimizing some sort of a gradients. And so what we want to do is essentially uh, using this piece of information to do something similar. So um, based on the prediction the model is generating. So here is the model, and the model is the one we are attacking, and we have some target label. We start with the aim tensor is the container we're going to change during the attack. So we start with the zeros, having exactly the same dimensions of the image the model is expecting as input. Then we get the predictions of the aim tensor from the model. So we pass into the model this empty tensor, and we, we, we get what the model thinks as in terms of predictions about this tensor. So we have this class predicted. And then, um, then we have a criterion, which is the cost function I was mentioning before. So for a certain number of times, so here it is, the, the alpha parameter, we keep on generating the predictions of the model uh, and um, essentially re-implementing the stochastic gradient descent step. Uh, 
So we have, we, we change the aim tensor minus the learning rate times the gradient of the aim tensor. So we are implementing manually the stochastic, stochastic gradient descent uh, step. And we keep on changing the aim tensor, passing on this data to the model and keep on changing the input to the model up until we gather the class we wanted. Is that clear, more or less? So in essence, what we do is we keep on asking the model, is this the right data for the class? Is this the right data for the class? And we, we change this, this guess we're producing by, by essentially following the gradient. We re implementing the optimization the model is doing internally, but without ac accessing the model. So to, to convince you what we're doing, Let's try to see what's the effect of this. Ah, by the way, the process function here, which is, uh, is one of the simplification I was mentioning before. So the process function is called at this point. So we generate the prediction. Uh, we, we have the target class, which is one of the parameter. We implement the optimization, stochastic gradient descent, and the, once we apply the SGD step, we then process the tensor. What we do here is just normalizing it. So we actually, uh, in, in my implementation, we just subtract the minimum and divide by maximum minus the minimum. This is what we're doing. It's a simple normalization of the tensor. In the original paper, they do some more fancy things, like they take the PCA components, they use those to, to even improve that. And this is actually converging less steps uh, and having better quality results. But even with this simple process function, you, you're going to see in a second what, what we're going to do uh, to the model. So we have the MI phase uh, ready. We have the softmax reg model, which is the target in this case, and we try 10 different classes. Okay. So just to be clear, the softmax reg model is the pre-trained one. So we, we call it, we instantiate it, and we load the weights. So we have a pre-trained model here. We're not training anything now. So we run the attack. And right. So class number zero, we start with an empty tensor. This is what we get. We start class number one, empty tensor. This is what we get. We start empty tensor, and so on and so forth. This is what we get. So again, the quality of the reconstructed image is really bad because we didn't do any pre-process, any yeah, post-processing or pre-processing, whatever you want it, call it. But you can improve this by just changing how you normalize the images during the process. But even without norm any, any tailored normalization, you, you can immediately say the model has been trained on these faces. And you can some sort of reconstruct the data the model has been trained on by just accessing, accessing the predictions. Yes? Okay. How sensitive is it for... No, I'm going to repeat the question. Thank you. Okay. How sensitive is it uh, to the initial state? So you start with an empty tensor. What if you start with an image from different class that you have already predicted? OK. So the question is uh, how much the uh, initial data you pass on in the beginning of the attack is going to affect the... Uh, so my guess, I haven't tried it, but my guess is it's just going to take more time to converge. The thing is, you, you, the reason why you start with, with empty one, well, if you have access to some data from the data set, that's going to converge e uh, quickly. But if you, starting with, a, with, a, with an empty tensor essentially means that you have no access whatsoever to the data. So it, like, you start fresh. You have no idea what data has been used. Because you don't have access to the data, you just have access to the predictions of the model. And you can reconstruct this kind of information from the model itself. So without having any access to any data, any internals of the model. That's what I'm, to that's what I, that's what I'm talking about. No worries. Any other question? Yes. Sorry, can you say it again? Yes. Uh, did I understand it correctly that we are basically feeling at noise over and over again? And if it's the correct class, we're averaging the noise and get the picture here. In this case, we don't have the concept of noise. We do have the concept of changing 
the, the data we provide to the model until we gather, un until the model says, yes, this is a sample of the class I know. And essentially, the, what we're talking about here is, so why this, mo why this is easier to see with simpler networks with few layers? Because essentially, these few models, uh, these two models have been overfitting the data set. So they're going to tell you when the sample is very, very close to the sample they've been uh, trained on, on these particular classes, they say, yes, this look, looks like something uh, I know, and this is the class I know. Before that, they were predicting different classes, so they were predicting wrong classes, and that's why the attack was still working. Because if you, but that's a very good question. So the attack, again, is based on two parameters, the model and the class we're aiming for. So we know the, mo the model is producing class of pandas, for example, uh, or like, do not confuse with example, let's say phase number one. And so we don't know phase number, who phase number one is, we just try to guess from random data, but the way we randomly change the input we pass on to the model is like essentially replicating what the model was doing internally uh, using the stochastic gradient descent step. So we're not just like, like randomly, randomly guessing. We're just guessing with some information how the model internally works. So the image that we are seeing here as the result of our attack is basically the image that we are feeding with the highest probability of being the class. Yes, okay. exactly. Very correct. Yes. Uh, I guess I don't thank you all for, for the microphone, by the way, to the volunteers. Um, Nice. So this is what we stand at. I guess we can take a break now. Uh, we have another hour or so in front of us. So we can take a five minutes break if you don't want to. And just to leave you a little bit of hype of what is going to be the solution to this kind of problem. And in particular, we're going to see in the, in, in the, when we reconvene, we're going to see what can we do to avoid this kind of reconstruction. Well, there's no big hype, actually. If you look at the repository, you have the answer already. But um, that's, that's what we do. And I guess we can, re can restart at half um, uh, 11.30, half past. Does that fine? Yes. Good. So what? Uh, there was no question. I was just calling for the break. Shall I keep recording, or I can stop now? Uh, I have an, half an hour. Uh -huh. oh, it's not until no, it's after 12. twelve. No, twelve thirty. Twelve. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I completely f forgot time. Um, are you tired at all? Do, do you mind if we skip the break? We, yeah. we see very quickly. I, are, you, are you okay with continuing, or do you, do you want to kill me in the meantime? Okay, if you promise you're going to kill me, I like skip the break very quickly, um, and I'm going to show you what can we do about it. Sorry, I just I, just, I was totally uh, sure it was up until 12:30. Nice. Okay, so I just want to switch back to the slides now. And I want to introduce to the concept of differential privacy. So um, I guess we're still good with times, actually. Good. So let's talk about differential privacy. And let me give you an introduction to differential privacy in a way I found particularly smart. So let's have a look at this data set. It's a data set of faces. And if you look carefully at this data set, you can definitely tell who's in the picture. You can see all the very details of the, every single samples in this data set. But in the end, from a machine learning perspective, we're not really interested most of the time to the single sample. We are just interested in the bigger picture. We are not interested at all to, this is very British, I reckon, I'm sorry. But um, this is what we're actually interested. We really want to see the bigger picture, the whole thing. And most of the time, we don't want to see the single ones. But what if we just then obfuscate a few technical information? We just 
want to come up with these version of the data set in a, in a way that the bigger picture doesn't change. And that's exactly the reason why uh, we're talking. That's exactly the basic of, um, concept behind differential privacy. Um, differential privacy, different from k-anonymity approach, is very different, though. It changes completely the perspective. Privacy in k-anonymity, if you remember, I put lots of effort in telling you that with k-anonymity, the privacy concept is a property of data. With differential privacy, the privacy concept is a property of the algorithm and not the data anymore. Uh, I'm going to explain in a little bit um, what I mean by that, but just bear in mind that both the two approaches are, form are formally sound, so they both have a formal definition of privacy. And uh, so it's definitely pro possible for both of them to prove whether the data release as a property of privacy. And so, essentially, in k-anonymity, privacy is a property of the, of, the, of the data. In differential privacy, the, dif the, pro the privacy of the data is a consequence of the privacy of the algorithm working on the data. In particular, how this works uh, on um, machine learning data, uh, we can integrate, we can slightly change uh, the um, machine learning training pipeline by using differentially private approach. Uh, we can aggregate count on data, we can compute mean, we can complex, we can train a complex uh, machine learning model, and essentially, uh, this is how it um, works. Um, this is how Opacus works, which is a, a privacy engine on, built on top of uh, PyTorch. So normally, when you train a model, you have a, a step word back in which you propagate the gradient to the parameters, and that's it. With the, with the Opacus approach, essentially, when you back propagate, before changing the parameters of the model, you apply differentially private operators. So you aggregate, you clip, you add some noise, and you, sorry about that, and you change the parameters. The interesting thing to remember, again, is always the, so the, the rules of the game are always, are always the same. Essentially, when you apply noise to data, you want to, if you remember the privacy dilemma, you always have uh, to bear in mind that whenever you're perturbing your data, whether this being k anonymity or differentially uh, private data, you always want to bear in mind that any modification to data you make, they shouldn't harm the utility of the data in the end. So whenever we, we say we add noise to the data, we have to think of a way to properly add noise, not just random noise, but carefully selecting ways in which we can modify the data to not arm the utility of the data. So let's go back now to the, I guess, yes. Let's go back to the um, notebooks. Um, so I'm going to go very quickly here, so mostly to tell you why differential, differentially, um, differential privacy is interesting. Opacus is just a, an engine we're going to use for PyTorch model. Um, in this notebook, you, you can find a few definitions of differential privacy and a few properties of differential privacy. Uh, in the extended version of the notebook, there's an, a whole section about it. So all the details, I would definitely recommend going there. But the formal definition of, of differential privacy is you do have a function, and this function, f, satisfies differential privacy. Um, this function is normally called a mechanism in differential pri differentially privacy. Uh, a mechanism is just an algorithm, just to be clear. Uh, so we, we say that the mechanism, f, satisfies differential privacy if for all neighboring, uh, neighboring data sets, uh, it's a very strange word, neighborhood, neighboring data sets, x and x prime, all the possible output S essentially follow this relationship. Essentially, in very simple terms, you, you up to certain uh, kind of parameters, so th there's a E to the epsilon here, so the epsilon parameter is the, the parameter of the differentially, uh, dif differential privacy, so up to certain parameter, you can never tell whether the value you get from the algorithm about a single data, single point of data, is either the original data or the randomly perturbed data. So whenever you 
querying. The, in the differential, differential previously, there's this concept of query and asking something to the database. So whenever you're getting some, some result from, from the system, so from, from, from the database, you will never know whether that is the, 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 original, uh, the original value or the perturbed value, so the, the noisy value. That, that, that's what we're talking about. And this is the, the concept of uh, neighbors in, in data set. And two data sets are considered neighbors if they defer by one single individual. Um, the epsilon parameter in, in differential, differential privacy is called the budget, and specifically is the differential, uh, is the privacy budget. So that's, that's the parameter you want to tune in in order to understand how private you want the data to be. Um, and so, like, the rule of thumb of this is small values of epsilon, high privacy, large values of epsilon, less privacy, so you have less protection. How, we, how should we set epsilon to prevent bad out out outcomes in practice? Nobody knows. It's an open research question. But we have ways in which we can experiment it. Um, I'm just going to mention uh, two things here. And again, if you're interested in the details, I definitely recommend going to the extended version of this tutorial. Um, the properties of differential privacy are three in particular, and they will make sense in the machine learning concept uh, context. So first is a, uh, differentially, uh, uh, differential privacy is sequential um, composable, meaning that if F1 satisfies epsilon 1 differential privacy, and F2 satisfies epsilon 2 differential privacy, you can compose the two, like G, G of X, of F1, X, F2 of X, which essentially satisfies both epsilon 1 plus F2, epsilon 2 differential privacy. Meaning, if you have multiple concatenated operators into perhaps a deep learning uh, network or machine learning training, you can combine multiple uh, differentially private operators, and you still have guarantees of differential privacy. The second property, parallel composition. If you have a function working on x, which satisfies epsilon differential privacy, I'm going to zoom in a little bit, and we split the data into multiple partitions, reminding you like training test split, for example, the mechanism on, of f uh, works on every single releases of this partition. So f is still epsilon differentially private on x1, xk. Last but not least, Post-processing is a third property. Um, essentially, it says that it's impossible to reverse the privacy protection, uh, provided that the differential privacy um, uh, provided by the differential privacy uh, via post-processing. In other words, if f of x, x as a, as a data set, satisfies epsilon differential privacy, then for any deterministic or randomized function g, g of f of x satisfies epsilon differential privacy. So there's no way you can revert back the privacy uh, property. If you really want to know more, uh, one example, one of the standard example in, of what this f function is, is the Laplace mechanism. So that's uh, one of the, of the, of the standard uh, function you can apply on on uh, on your on your algorithms. Uh, so this is the the, the kind of noise we're going to consider in, in default to have uh, differential uh, privacy. Then there's also another version uh, which is approximate differential privacy, meaning you have an extra parameter uh, using Gaussian distribution rather than a Blaschen distribution. Um, and essentially, um, again, all the details of this. Uh, I don't have time to explain it, but uh, you, you'll find um, extensive description there uh, in, the, in the extended version of this tutorial. What, I'm, what I want to, to do now, though, is not talking about exactly how this thing works, but just showing you in practice how that works. So what we train, what we do in this notebook is doing exactly what we did in the MIA training, but this time we're going to use differentially private operators during training, and in particular using opacus. If you remember, I put the effort, uh, the accent on the train function. Again, this is the data set we're going to use, same things. Um, first off, we 
from a package, we have a module validator. Essentially, the module validator takes a model and takes, tells you whether the model can be or cannot be differentially private, meaning that some models, if they have specific layers as dropout or batch normalization, they are difficult to, to guarantee privacy because they have intrinsic leakage of the data because of randomness, so there's no, nothing you can do. Well, in, in, our case, uh, in our case, we don't, so we're good to go. And from practice, we do create this privacy engine. So this is the class that does exactly what we wanted. Um, we create this privacy engine, and this privacy engine takes um, a few parameters. It takes the, the model, the optimizer, the data loader, and the data loader is important because also we add noise in selection of the, of the samples and not just in the parameters of the model. So it's a double layer uh, privacy protection in this case, both at the data layer and then the parameters layer. And, and then we pass on the number of epochs we wanted to train this and, and also some of the parameters for the privacy, for differentially, uh, differential private, uh, privacy things. So we have epsilon, delta, and max gradient norm. Epsilon is the epsilon I told you already. Delta is because we're using Gaussian distribution, so an approximate um, um, uh, mechanism, uh, approximate uh, differential privacy. Um, so we have this, and it, everything is enca enca encapsulated. And what we get in return, we have the train loader, the, the optimizer, and the new model. What we do now is we call the same function, train, passing on the model and the new optimizer and the loaders returned by the previous engine. And the takeaway message from here is we don't have to change anything in your training procedure. So the, 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 the same training function I've been using before, I can use it again. So Opacus actually builds on top of PyTorch and wraps everything up for you and what it provides in return is, is an object which is totally compliant with PyTorch API. So you don't have to disrupt your uh, training pipeline at all. And, and then we train the model. And this model has 72.5% accuracy. So there's a drop in accuracy, that's for sure. And but that's expected, because we're working on privacy and randomized noise uh, with uh, randomized data. Uh, as well with randomized parameter. Uh, I have two versions of execution here. This is running on this laptop using CPU device. Uh, this is running on another laptop using M1 uh, uh, chip on, on Apple, having essentially 75% accuracy, but the, the, tre the, the trend is the same. So it's essentially the same thing. So we, start, we moved from 95% to 75% of accuracy. And uh, right, so th we have the train model. Let's see what's the effect of it in reconstruction. Let's open the notebook. Good. So now we're doing again the model inference attack. Same parameters as before, reconstruction parameter. This time we reconstruct, but we uh, use the soft mask regression trained with differential privacy. And we run the attack. Again, we started with an empty tensor. And this is what we're getting. So for all the samples, we are getting just noise. So we are not able to predict anything else anymore because there's no way the model can converge to any guess we're producing. Does that make sense? OK. So I just showed you one way in which we can essentially uh, provide protection to our model is using differentially uh, private uh, training process. And differential privacy, by the way, is what, so if you remember the example I told you in the beginning about the US census, differentially, uh, differential privacy is nowadays the technique the US census is using to, to release the data. So k anonymity is not used anymore because of the, the usual um, uh, issues that technique has. And if you, if you go into privacy protection technologies, differential privacy is certainly the cutting edge 
um, at the moment. All right, good. So we still have a few, mi a few minutes. I just want to talk about the last part of this tutorial, unless you have questions now. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, does Opacus support all uh, PyTorch layers? And if not, which are not supported yet? Uh, sorry, say so, so again. I don't get the, the, the beginning. Yeah, the question is, uh, does your uh, library Opacus support all PyTorch layers or all PyTorch blocks? It does support all PyTorch layers. Um, uh, just um, essentially all those that that's why the, model, the module validator exists. All those uh, for which uh, previously protection is not possible because of how the, the, the layers are built. And this, to, to the best of my knowledge, essentially uh, is limited to dropout and bash norm for sure, because they, they do have internal parameters you cannot uh, change uh, with differential privacy. Uh, and, and to the best of my knowledge, yes. Apart from those two, any other layer should work. I'm I, I, and I'm pretty sure also layers for recurrent neural networks should be working as well. Which one, sorry? The, for the RNN. So the LSTM or the uh, GRU layers are going to work. OK, thanks. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, second question. Uh, is the boilerplate necessary uh, when on your um, notebooks you uh, pop out weights to replace them with the model, uh, the custom model weights? So is this boilerplate necessary? Because if you have a lot of weights, you will have a lot of boilerplate and custom operation. Yeah, so essentially, that's a very good question. So when you have a bigger model, uh, what happens, oh, well, there's another thing I, I skipped, uh, another details I skipped away, uh, which is I train this uh, in the training bit. I train this network for double the number of ep epochs. So I trained the original model 100 epochs. This, the, the, the DP model has been trained for 200 epochs. This just because because of how the... Uh, the uh, deep, uh, differentially, um, differential privacy uh, privacy works. Uh, I, it took more time for the model to converge because it works on uh, random data. So uh, you, you n not only have just a drop in accuracy, you also need more computation time because the model might have, might have more difficulty and in converging. And so that's the the drawback. And um, another another thing is. Uh, if you have a bigger model, as you were saying, um, you apply you apply the differentially private operators in all of them, and and so they do work because they uh, because of how differentially uh, differential privacy works, uh, but um, it it takes just more time and um, it could be computationally heavier, um, and you have to expect a drop in in uh, performance. But on the other hand, you do have a private model anyway. Without without changing the data, uh, this is another interesting thing. So uh, we're not. Uh, so Im now we're talking about images. But imagine, um, and I can I can mention a few examples uh, even uh, offline uh, more detailed about it. But there were papers ex essentially talking about medical imaging and um, like being able to reconstruct specific. Phenotype, phenotypical information from um, from pathological images, for example. So, like the sex, the age of, of the patients from from a, a tissue image, just just to mention some. Uh, and um, also, uh, the interesting bit here is that we didn't touch the data at all. So we just applied differentially private operators on the data, but we're not changing the data before end. So if you have a sensitive data set, and this is probably the, the strongest takeaway message from, from this block, if you have a sensitive data set, the, the, the guarantee you have here with, with differentially uh, private operators is you just give me your data. I make sure I'm not going to leak any information from your data set in, in the machine learning model during the training. This is what I'm saying. Uh, yeah, so we basically had these two paradigms now. So one is changing the data, one is changing the algorithm. Yes. Um, so what's the difference in performance for both of them? Is there like something um, to say about it? Yeah, so essentially, just to be clear, you're not changing the data here, changing, you're applying changes to the loader, to the training loader. So it's, it's about how you create the batches. 
so you're not perturbing the images. You're just, um, I'm pretty sure Opacity is, uh, is working on the, on the parameters of the model most of the time. So the data sets remains, uh, should remain the same, yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, maybe you touched on this earlier, but does model complexity affect its vulnerability for uh, these inversion attacks? Like, would a more complex model be more or less vulnerable? Um, it, yes, that's a good point. Um, the, the model inversion attack I showcase, sure. Uh, but in the end, there's always a way you can revert back what you want if you carefully work on it, uh, which I didn't uh, for two reasons. One, uh, one is to prove a point. The second is the model we're talking here are very simple and overfitted. So it's, it's, it's like the simplest case to inverse, uh, to attack a model. Uh, but uh, in the end, you can always, you, you have more work to do, but you, you can get somewhere anyway. But complexity of the model certainly has something to do with it. That's for sure. Whoopsie. Yes. Good. Nice. So in the last 50 minutes or so, uh, I'm going to just mention um, one last thing, which is about uh, this question, why don't we allow AI without moving data from their silos? And um, essentially, this goes back to another important, uh, let me say, technology in this concept uh, called federated learning. Is any of you here already familiar with federated learning? Brilliant. So federated learning essentially works this way and has been developed uh, by Google originally, in order to find a way to train models based on mobile data without having them to share the data at all. Meaning, I can run any, I can multiple machine learning models on every single device you're having, but, and so I can leverage on your data on your phones without having you to send me your data on the centralized server. I don't need to have, if you think of it, at the end of the day, I don't need your data to train a model on the bigger server. I just have the computational power already on your phones, so you can do the computation for me. And all I need as a centralized entity, uh, I just need the gradients of your models, and that's it. But what happens when you want to have, uh, if you want to put this idea into a whole training process, this is what further learning works. This is how further learning works. Essentially, every single client has, has its own data and its own comp computing capability. Data will never move across clients. Data will stay where they are, so they, they still reside on the original clients. But there's a centralized entity, the centralized server, which is aggregating, and this is the key word in further learning, you, you can aggregate all the gradients of the model trained on every single client. And once you aggregate all the, all the gradients, you have a strategy to aggregate those. For example, you can average them. And once you have, have generated this average gradient, which is internally encapsulating the information of, of all the gradients uh, calculated from all the clients, I can distribute the average gradient to everyone. And so every single client now has the gradient which is encapsulating the data of any other client already, and it can start from, from the average gradient to keep on training the model. Is that, is that more or less uh, clear on how that works? So you're essentially sharing, uh, the centralized entity is sharing the, the average gradients, but the data is still living, uh, is not moving from where they are. And you can complicate this thing by adding encryption. And the kind of encryption you want to add uh, into this thing is a specific kind of encryption in which you, you can work on uh, encrypted data in a way that whenever you are going to decrypt this data, the decrypted data is going to make sense. In other words, you are looking for a specific kind of encryption which is robust to 
algebraic operations, summations, multiplications. This specific encryption is called a monomorphic encryption, and this is an extended version of a further learning approach. You can have a federated approach into training with multiple clients, so you have data distributed in multiple clients, and each client is talking encrypted data. In this way, are using a morphic encryption. Uh, certainly, you have an increment in complexity and computation and all of that, that's for sure, but in the end, you can still have the, uh, and, and the encryption is based on a public and private key, um, kind of approach, and all the data moving on the networks in the distribution is totally encrypted. So uh, there are different ways in which you can do that. Homomorphic encryption is one of them. And um, essentially, the whole idea is that you, you don't, having encrypted data moving across the, 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 the communication channels is safer because this is one of the cases, and probably something I should have said in the very beginning, uh, this is a cross path between security and privacy. So this is one of the uh, first examples we say we finally see um, uh, an intersection between privacy and security. We, we've been talking privacy all the time here today. We never mention any security issue. Here is one of um, intersection within the two sectors. So security here meets privacy. So you're using secure channels, using encryption for privacy protection. Uh, the very last thing I want to mention about this is how further learning works. Essentially, further learning is based on this concept of, uh, I can probably show you that into the notebooks, so to tell you what's, what's in there. Uh, there is an example of morphing encryption. I'm, I'm not going to say that. Um, I just want to show you this. Well, this is how the further, um, further learning works in general. Uh, there's also, um, yeah, well, it says uh, there's a few uh, questions here. I just wanted to mention one important thing. Uh, the, the, the further learning gig is working based on one assumption, and this is um, uh, very important. So you can have a further learning system, um, and this, this system can be, so essentially the, 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 the important thing to mention here is whenever you have a data set, you can apply a further learning approach, uh, either, it's said, either horizontal or vertical, uh, meaning that all the clients we're talking about, they do have to share something to make this meaningful. So what I'm trying to say is the opposite of, I have a client working on Emily's data, data set. I have a client working on all faces, Iris data set, let's say, okay? And I aggregate the gradients of these two models. It doesn't make any sense because they're working on two different data sets, okay? What, we, what we're talking about here is we have two clients working on some partitions of the, of the same data set. And this partition can be either horizontally, sorry, vertical, horizontal. Meaning that the clients, they do have to share either the same samples or the same features. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. So when you partition the data horizontally, it means that all the clients share the same features, they just have different samples. Okay, so I have my samples, you have your samples, they have their samples, that's it. If you, if you partition the data set vertically, each, all, this, all the clients have the, exactly the same samples, they just have different features. I'll give you examples very quickly. If you, an example of vertical partition of further learning is, I do have clinical information about this data, sorry, uh, I have a clinical data set about the subset of patient, Another hospital has medical imaging about that same set of patients. I combine them. That works. Because I have the same samples, different features. Different example, I have a database uh, of um, uh, uh, a database for machine learning. It's not really important. Another entity has the labels. So I just like combine them using the labels on one entity, uh, uh, some samples, 
Uh, I have my samples on the same data, like I'm training my model on sensory data using sort of the same features, whatever. Uh, I have my sensor data, you have your sensor data, we can combine them, sort of, okay? So in this case, you have horizontal further learning because you split the data horizontally. You have a big data set, you split horizontally, but the features are gonna be the same. If none of these two are gonna um, um, be valid in your assumption, further learning cannot be applied, just to be clear. Okay, is that clear? Good. Um, so it's gonna be almost time. So I just want to mention the very last thing, which is how do you implement this in a PyTorch ecosystem? And I, in, uh, in, in the repository, you can see an, an example of the learning approach using Flower, uh, pack, uh, Flower uh, uh, library. Flower is a um, uh, further learning client and server for PyTorch and any deep learning frameworks, to be honest. I'm just using the PyTorch integration, but it works on any, on any deep learning. is, is framework agnostic to, to, to the best of my knowledge. And essentially what you do, I just show you very quickly how you use it rather than um, make it work. The, the notebook is executed already, so you can uh, skim through it and, and, and see how that works. Uh, or try to run it on your end. Um, to simulate the tutorial here, what we do, we take the dataset, MNIST again, and we partition it uh, so that every single client has a subset of samples. Again, this is a horizontal classical further learning. So every single client has a subset of samples, but they do share the same features, meaning they do share the same images, uh, features in terms of uh, pixels in the images. And um, we have a partition data, so we partition the data set into multiple clients. We divide it onto the local data sets, so we're trying to split for each client. Uh, the important thing, well, this is a centralized non further learning version, not interesting here. That's the flower client. That's a typo, sorry about that. I'll just fix it and then update it. And essentially, when you create a, um, a flower uh, further learning client, what you have to do is create a class which extends a uh, flower client class. Uh, NumPy client is the easier one to work with tensors. So you, you, you have lots of boilerplate you don't have to repeat. Otherwise, you have a general client you can um, uh, specify and um, um, modify as, 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 as you like, depending on what you want to do in your um, FL approach. Um, essentially, you do have to define a function to get the parameters, and this is the function that the server is going to call, call out to return the parameters of the model. So this is the step that in which you, the uh, FL needs to share the gradients, so the parameters of the model. And you have a fit function, which essentially sets the parameters, train the model, and returns the parameters. This is what you have to do. Um, and and uh, this is the client, so this is what is, is gonna be representing the single client with time. Uh, and the last thing you do is you set up a metric aggregation to uh, decide how do you want to manage the multiple gradients from different clients. The, mul the, the standard way to do that is using average of, of, the, of the gradients. So Flower provides a strategy already with that, which is fed AVG, so for the uh, averaging. Um, you can set up your strategy, and one you're done, once you've done that, you'll say, well, in this case, you start a simulation because it runs in the notebook, otherwise you run the, the server, and the multiple clients, and they, they talk to each other. And this is uh, how it works. Uh, in, in your start simulation, what you provide is um, a function to create the client, which is instantiate the NumPy clients we defined. How many clients do we want? The server config is how many rounds you want to do the FL update. You pass, in, you pass on the strategy, and you run it. That's it. 
And this is just a simulation in the notebook uh, using Ray, by the way, if you're interested, um, to avoid me running, uh, to avoid running a ser spawning a server in multiple clients. Uh, but they, they, are, they are indeed uh, server and clients, genuine server and clients, meaning they can stay on multiple machines remotely and they talk over networks. Uh, that, that's that's as, as expected. And in the history return about the function, you also see the, the performance, so you can actually keep track on um, uh, the, of the performance uh, gain uh, from, from the multiple clients. Right. Um, I guess we are really at time, and that's really all I wanted to tell you. If you have questions, otherwise, thank you so very much. I will be around the whole week anyway. So if you have questions or you, you, have, uh, you take a look at the extended version of the materials and you also have other questions, please feel free to reach out. I'm more than happy to talk about this. Thank you very much.